Well, tonight we begin a study of another one of John, the Apostle John's work, always keeping in mind that it is God who wrote the Bible. When we say John or Paul, Peter, said thus and so, of course, we mean the human hand uh, that wrote it down that was inspired by the Holy Spirit. We must remember that when we speak of the Bible being inspired by the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, that we're not talking about someone with uh, genius such as uh, Shakespeare or a Milton or a Longfellow. That is called inspiration too, but that's not what is meant when we say all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It means that these words were given by God via the Holy Spirit to certain ones, the writers of the Bible, and that he guided them infallibly to record his will for us. And that's the reason you have 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, reading the way that it does, as well as other passages that are parallel to it. While we studied the book of John, his gospel account, we were studying a book the design of which is to convert people to Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. And I might mention, having said only begotten Son of God, that the Apostle John is the only one who uses that terminology in the Greek, only begotten comes from uh, monogenes, monogenes. And there's been a lot of people trying to say that it doesn't uh, mean only begotten. Well, all members of the Lord's church, because that's God's family, 1 Timothy 3.15, are children of God. So it's obvious that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is not the Son of God the way we are children of God. He is a one of a kind. He's only begotten Son of God, which simply means it's that way that the second person of the Godhead became a human being. First John, or rather John 1, 1 and 2 in verse 14. So that account of the gospel was meant by John to prove that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. Now, as we come over to the first epistle or letter of the Apostle John, we need to understand that he shifts gear. Now, you can parallel it uh, a lot, and you have a good introduction to it by being very familiar with the Gospel of John. But here he's writing to those who do believe that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the only begotten Son of God. And they have obeyed the gospel of Christ, God's power to save men from sin, Romans 1 verse 16. In other words, they have not only accepted the evidence that proves the deity of Christ, but they've obeyed what the truth of Christ taught them to do to become a Christian. And that is following belief, they are commanded, as all men are, to repent of their sins, Acts 17 and 30, Luke 13, 3 and 5. They are expected to be willing to confess their belief, Romans 10, 10. And then to complete their obedience to the gospel by being buried with their Lord in baptism into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that is, by the authority of Christ, to obtain the remission of sins. Acts 2, verse 38. Matthew 28, 18, verses following, Mark 16, 16, and so on. These people have all heard that, and they've done it. They did just what Paul said the Romans did in Romans 6, 17, and 18. So they had obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine in other words, that pattern of teaching, which was delivered them, being then made free from sin 
they became the servants of righteousness. And the Greek word there, servant, translates, um, or rather servants, translates the Greek word doulos, which means a slave. So in effect, people who become Christians have chosen to be a slave to Christ. Now, a slave doesn't go about doing what he wants to, when he wants to do it, the way he wants to do it. But he does his master's will. And thus we, human beings, create creatures of God, recognizing that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, and are separated by that sin, thus needing reconciliation, Romans 6, verse 23, have heard the gospel call. We've understood the way of salvation to gain remission of past and alien sins. And thus, we're baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, Galatians 3, 27, and uh, Acts 2, verse 38. These folks had done all of that. So what is John doing? He realizes, as we should as members of the church, that people who are members need to be taught also. They need to be edified, and that's what we mean by edifying the church, is building it up. This letter is meant to at least edify or build up spiritually those to whom it is sent originally and since it's part of the New Testament of Christ uh, to us today until the end of time. So when Jesus came to earth, we understand, as John makes it clear, that he not only came to live a certain kind of life, but to save us from our sins, make it possible for us to become Christians, which means of Christ, members of his family, 1 Timothy 3.15. He came to give life. He gave his own life that we might have life. And you run into that, if you remember, back over in John chapter 10 and verse number 10, where Christ, as John writes, said, I've come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. And John's got that in mind, no doubt, as he begins to write this letter. When we say, of course, and I need to interject this here, we said it all through our study of the Gospel of John. When we say it's designed to prove to people that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Messiah, the Son of God, we don't mean that it's not worth reading by those who are Christians. Certainly, it is because of what it's designed to do along with Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But we're simply noticing the original purpose of the book. So this gospel of John that we read, and we ended up this last week, as we finished the book, was designed to produce faith in Christ as a son of God, the way, the truth, and the life, that no man comes to the Father but by him, John 14, 6, that we might have life so he came to live a certain life he gave his own life and he gave his own life that he might give us life and uh, i've already mentioned john 20 30 31 showing the very design and purpose of the gospel of john but now when we come to the first epistle of john we see that he is discussing the, for lack of a better way to put it, the very nature of Christ's life or that life that we live as Christians in the church, the body of Christ, the kingdom of Christ, the family of God. So he's going into greater detail on that. And we'll know more about that later if you want to jot down 1 John 3, verse 14 1 John 3, 14, along that line you can, but we'll notice more of that later. He is trying to make sure 
that we live the sort of life that is well-pleasing to God. And that is the life doing the will of the Son. So I would say, and it would be true, of course, of any book, that we must study it carefully. Now, we're in the introductory portion of the first epistle. And we want to look a little bit, although we've already said it, that it is the Apostle John, son of Zebedee, and the brother of James, who was killed early on after the church was established by Herod. And we're simply citing the fact that everything coming from the so-called church fathers indicates that they firmly believed that John the Apostle wrote this book or this letter. John had two uh, pupils, and uh, one of them was uh, Papias, and he wrote saying plainly that John wrote the book of First John. The other one we're probably more familiar with, if we're familiar with any other, and that's Polycarp, who also said it's the feet of John. And they both testified that he wrote this book. Now, we're not saying they were inspired. We're simply saying that their material has come down to us. As any historical document has come down to us, and that's what they say. Similarities between this letter and the Gospel of John, I think, constitutes internal evidence that John the Apostle is the writer of the book. But I said, too, that there is this external material, meaning coming from people like Polycarp and others. If you've never read the church fathers, as they are called, then you'll see they testify to a lot of things like that. But remember, they lived in a relationship to the church of the first century, even as we do. You say, yeah, but they were a lot closer to it. Nevertheless, they didn't experience a lot of that stuff. Uh, material and a lot of happenings. And we certainly can't go through and testify to anything along those lines. We can tell what has come down to us from either the inspired writings or those such as Polycarp and Papias who heard John teach. Now, who received the book? Well, no one specifically is mentioned as to, uh, as by name. It's assumed uh, that, therefore, it is a general epistle, meaning that it's written to all Christians everywhere to edify them and to strengthen them. As best we can tell, John was in the city of Ephesus, at this particular time, and we learn that from the same way we learn a number of things about the book from the so-called church fathers. But it's interesting, and I don't know how to say it otherwise, but when you turn over and read 1 John 2, verses 20 and 27, 20. And 27, you have this. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. And then number 27, verse 27. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie. And even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. 
You know, why is he writing that way? Well, you know something about these people. And you must remember the miraculous age continues on as John, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes this letter. Well, remember, it's going to make up part of the New Testament of Christ. So the people had the miraculous gift that they could exercise if they used them appropriately. Now, being that we've never lived where they had such gifts, and there were nine of them that are listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and they were given to the church through the laying on of the apostles' hands because they had no written New Testament. But they were expected by God to live faithful Christian lives. So in lieu of a completed New Testament, they had these gifts. Now it's obvious from reading 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 that they could be abused because the Corinthians certainly did. So just because you had a miraculous gift or because you were an apostle baptized in the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2 did not mean you didn't have to exercise your mind according to godliness. Paul even said that he sought to buffet himself and bring himself into subjection lest uh, after preaching to others, he himself was a castaway. So it's difficult for us who did not have some gift like that that was instantaneous and miraculous, yet subject to our will, even to the point of it being abused or not used when it ought to be used or used in the proper way. It's hard for us, if not completely impossible, for us to realize that. But it seems that in those verses, in verse John 2, that he's indicating you have the wherewithal to know all you need to know. But now by the fact that we have a written New Testament, been around nearly 2,000 years, tells us that those gifts would not always be here. If those gifts were here today, I wouldn't be telling people just to read the New Testament. I would say, listen to the people with the gifts and be urging people to follow the instructions of the Spirit on the usage of those gifts. But they never were considered by the knowledgeable person in the first century who was faithful to Christ to be a permanent fixture of the church. They were simply there to get the New Testament revealed, completed, and proven to men that it came from heaven, from God, and not from men. Such was designed and uh, the very purpose of miracles. When it came to Christ, they proved that he was a son of God. When it came to the apostles preaching, then they could prove it by working miracles. And you'll remember that Philip preaching in Samaria, though he was not an apostle of Christ, thus he did not receive the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit. Yet the people realized that he had something that was not natural, normal to a human being because they were amazed the fact that he did miracles really did them to prove the message that it was from heaven and not from men and that it was of necessity if they would be saved from their sins that they listened to the truth of God he was speaking. So we see John saying that about the truth of God. We don't know all we would like to know about all of this. I don't suppose there's any part of the Bible that we could say we know all we'd like to know. Well, I found out quite a while ago that with what's revealed and Paul saying that uh, when you read what he wrote, you'd understand his knowledge in the mystery of Christ that I had plenty to take care of just what's written in, in the Bible. Let's less wonder about other things. So 
John may have been in Ephesus when he wrote it. He may have written it with some people who had the Holy Spirit, as I just read it a moment ago, talked about it in mind, that they could uh, be mindful of using that. I've even thought, too, that this may say to them that that had the miraculous gift to which he referred here, that they could have special insights into some of these things that the Holy Spirit directly gave them. We just don't know. But the purpose, I think, of the book is declared by John in the epistle. First of all, notice verse 4. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Right, there's one of the reasons that John is writing this letter to Christians. Tells me that Christ wants those who are Christians, members of his church, to have all the joy that God can bestow upon a person in the flesh on this earth. It's not going to be like a bunch of cheerleaders or a pep rally. It's not that kind of joy. It's the mental or spiritual contemplation that all is right between me and God. And that's a very important point. Another reason that he wrote it is found in the second chapter in verse number one, that ye may not sin. That ought to be obvious uh, to any of us that the person who truly becomes a Christian and all that the New Testament teaches about that has been converted. There's a change. It didn't happen apart from the convert's will. It happened because of the convert's will. You can know all there is to know about how to become a Christian and never become one. Because you won't. You will not submit your will to his will. But in order to be converted, to cease from the practice of sin, not caring what God wants, and doing just as you please, then when you hear the truth and know it, Christ himself came to save you. You understand all those things John wrote about in the Gospel of John. Then when you are brought to that kind of belief in him, then you want to obey. You know he knows the way to heaven and you don't. You know he knows the way to keep you from transgressing his will on this earth. So when a person obeys the gospel, they're baptized for the Remission of sins, Acts 2, verse 38. There are those who teach that folks must be baptized, immersed in water, but not to obtain remission of sins in the mind of God. They, in fact, will say you're saved the moment you believe without any acts of obedience on your part, and then you're baptized to imitate Christ's baptism or as an outward sign this would be the way they say it of an inward grace but that's just not the case inspired Peter in 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 21 plainly said baptism does also now save us well it does or it doesn't Peter lied or he told the truth it doesn't mean it alone standing by itself saves us because a person is not scripturally qualified to be baptized for the remission of sins if they haven't believed in God or Christ or the Bible as infallible, errant, all sufficient, final, and complete revelation of God to man. If they haven't rightly divided the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2 15. If they haven't repented of their sins and confessed their faith in Christ. They're not qualified yet to be baptized. But when all of that's been done by a person, now they're qualified to be immersed in water by the authority of Christ to obtain the remission of sins. It is a burial, a baptism into the death of Christ, Romans 6, 3, and 4, from which the candidates raised to walk in newness of life. Why? Because in baptism, his sins are forgiven. 
Did the water have any power to wash him? No, not at all. No more than did the leprosy of Naaman in 2 Kings chapter 5 in the Old Testament. The waters of the Jordan River in and of themselves cleanses leprosy. The thing that cleanses Naaman's leprosy, 2 Kings 5, is the same thing that cleanses us from sin as we're baptized today. And that's because of our faith in Christ and our proof of our faith in Christ by our obedience to his will. Jesus said plainly even to his apostles, if you love me, ye will keep my commandments. John 14, 15, American Standard Version 1901. There is no proof of true love of God in Christ and doing it some way other than obeying Christ. There's no way to prove one's faith, one's confidence, one's belief in Christ except to take him at his word and comply with his will. And that ties in with the very sentiments of the whole Bible that the whole duty of man is to fear God and keep his commandments. So we see John saying, I'm writing to you that your joy may be full. We see him saying plainly that I'm writing to you that you may not sin. So once we become Christians, guess what? We can sin. That once for all, if no other place does, and it does abundantly throughout the New Testament, prove that once you're saved, you're not always saved. You can so sin as to fall from the grace of God. If not, what does he mean here? To commit sin is to engage in the only thing there is that can separate you from God. So he's saying part of the reason I'm writing you, even though you've obeyed the gospel, as we've discussed, you've been baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. You've been added to the church. Now, I'm writing not only that your joy may be full, but that you don't sin. So it's not the desire of a Christian to sin. They don't like sin. They hate sin. They know sin is of the devil. They know it's the greatest enemy they have. And they know that unforgiven sin is the only thing that can keep them out of heaven. So John says, I want you to learn the importance of not sinning. He also pointed out that he wrote to them that they might know they have eternal life. 1 John 5, 13, first part of the verse. We're taught in Romans 8, verse 24, that we are saved by hope. I've done this on so many occasions, but it seems appropriate to do it again. The word hope there means what a faithful member of the church, a Christian, has to expect and a right to expect it when this old world's over and done with and we stand at the judgment. We long to hear fall from the lips of our Savior concerning us, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. John saying, this letter is written to you that you may know you have eternal life. There is coupled with that expectation of the faithful child of God of eternal life, the earnest desire to receive the reward. Who wants to continue indefinitely on this earth or to be on this earth any longer than God requires when you've loved God and spent your life seeking after him, seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? Regardless of who we are, male or female, rich or poor, regardless of our ethnicity, we're going to die. Hebrews 9, 27 says, it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. 
But it's how you die. Do you die faithful to the Lord? John will in the book of Revelation even admonish people that if you're under such severe persecution that you have to die rather than renounce Christ and be thou faithful unto death and you'll receive the crown of life. Revelation 2.10. That sounds like to me they're pretty positive that they have eternal life. These thoughts and these ideas about possessing eternal life should motivate every one of us to do more in the way of walking according to the truth of God. He also says that I'm writing to you that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. 1 John 5 13b, that is the latter part of verse 13. We noticed the first part of the earlier. There is but one authority on this earth, in heaven and on earth, that will save us. There is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Acts 4. And now that within itself ought to make all of us recognize whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by him. Colossians 3.17. Again, in the name of the Lord means by his authority. When somebody says stop in the name of the law. They mean they have the authority of the law as a law enforcement officer to call on somebody to stop. We understand then the term in the name of means by the authority of. So there are the reasons I suggest to you that John by inspiration wrote these, this letter. That it is designed to uplift, and to strengthen, to give us joy, to keep us from sinning, to make us focus on the great reward of eternal life and to cause us to remember the authority of Christ, the name of Christ, that no matter who says what, contrary to him and what he's written, it doesn't change a thing. Now, these reasons may state the positive side of John's purpose, and I think they do. But it also seems to appear, you study the letter, that he was responding to certain errors that were growing in the church at that time. Look at chapter 2 and verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. 1617. We therefore are concerned about these things. John says that in the first part of 1 John 2 because guess what? This has allowed people to be moved of the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Verse 26 reads, These things have I written unto you concerning them which seduce you. Are there people who will seduce members of the church? Seduction has the idea of selling a person on a lie than, that it's the truth when it's not. You get them to do what you want them to do by doing that. So as we looked at the positive part of it, we see John going into chapter 2, declaring pain, plainly where or how Satan approaches us. That's through the flesh. And there were those that were at that time in the church seeking to draw people away from the gospel in some way or another. Now, I'm pretty sure, and if you read the commentaries and various other 
um, information such as the so-called church fathers. You have what's called Gnosticism. And I know everybody here, at least I think most have, have heard that word. And in John's day, it was not fully developed. Uh, what was, it was in the process really of developing into what became known as full-fledged Gnosticism. Now, these folks claim to have superior knowledge to everybody else. Uh, Gnosticism or comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means to know. And one branch of them believe that all matter is evil. Therefore, God didn't create or have anything to do for that matter with the material universe. So Christ could not have come in the flesh. Well, do you notice that John is pretty particular about making it clear that Jesus did come in the flesh? If you look at the first few verses, you will see that he makes sure everybody knows that he knew Christ had flesh through empirical knowledge. Now, if you look at verses one through three of first uh, John four, you'll see that he tells people don't just accept things because somebody that you trust hands it out to you. We love, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits to see whether the be of God for many false prophets have gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. Now, he wrote that almost 2,000 years ago. And so you might say he's trying to nip the thing in the bud, for lack of a better way to put it. Now, when you look at Gnosticism, you see that it took two courses two different kinds of it, in other words. One branch of Gnosticism is called uh, docetism, from dokine, the Greek word, to seem, meaning to seem. And it said that Jesus only seemed to be physical. Now notice how John starts his epistle. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. And then what we've already read too. But then there was a fellow named by the name of Serenthus. He taught that Jesus, now let's put quotes around Jesus here so we can get what this false teacher taught. He said Jesus was physical, but that the, quote, Christ, unquote, came upon Jesus at his baptism and left before he died on the cross so that the spirit, the Christ spirit, never suffered. Well, those are the two views and they develop more than they would be at this time that John was dealing later into the second century and becoming even a, a bigger problem. But listen to 1 John 5 and verse 6. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit that beareth witness because the spirit is true. 
So when you see Christ in the garden, so troubled that he prays, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Then he was in agony of spirit. And I think sometimes in our focusing upon the fact that his body is suffering physically through the scourging and all the things they did to him, then certainly in the crucifixion, that we fail to realize that he was being pained inwardly as the second person of the Godhead tabernacled in that fleshly body. So this was just an effort on the part of these false teachers to get things done the way they wanted done. It was their exercise of their will to get men to submit to them. So their application to everyday living took two different directions. Here's the way it went. Since all matter they taught was evil, some thought they should abstain altogether from anything that would satisfy the appetites of the flesh. But then others of them claimed that, well, it really didn't matter what one did in the flesh. It was evil anyway. And to have full knowledge of whatever the flesh could involve itself in made it a proper thing to do in exploring everything the body could do. Well, you can see rather quickly where that would lead first. Well, that's the idea. The spirit is saved, but the flesh can't be stopped from doing evil. So we'll just gratify every appetite of the flesh anyway. It suits us. And I think you'll find that many of John's comments in this letter appear to address these false teachings. Now, let me, let me sum up as we come to the end of the class. Remember, in a positive way, that the letter was written to Christians to edify them and to strengthen them, that their joy might be full, that they might not sin, that they would know they have eternal life. And that they are to believe, continue to believe in the name of Jesus Christ. But it's interesting that in this letter designed to strengthen these Christians, the Holy Spirit through John thought that they needed to be warned about false teaching that would corrupt these things concerning their joy and that would lead them into sin and would cause them to lose eternal life and to actually deny the authority of Christ. I want to uh, pause here because next week we'll just get right into the chapter more particularly. It's thought, I will say, I was going to do this in the beginning and I didn't think about it. Some people think there was an early date, but most all would put the date of the writing of First John around the end of the first century, somewhere around the same time the book of Revelation was written. Now, again, as to being able to say, we absolutely know beyond a shadow of a doubt the exact year he wrote and so on. I don't know anybody to do that, but by looking at all that it has to do with and all that those who lived after John said. It's, and there's had to be time for, you know, a thing has to exist for some time for false teaching to arise, for people to fall away. And that's happening here. So the church has been around for a while. Paul even writes about those things. So we, we think of it as being written somewhere around 96. I wouldn't fall out. Somebody would have it earlier. There's no reason to, because we can get the meaning of the message of it without knowing the exact year. So we will think of it and refer to it as we go through the study chapter by chapter uh, as being written in the late latter part of the 90s of the first century.
So we'll terminate here for tonight. And if you would, let's go to Heavenly Father in prayer as we close the class. Our Father in heaven, we again humbly approach thee, recognizing our weaknesses and shortcomings. Thankful for thy mercy extended to us by Christ through the gospel. Thankful for people who love the truth. Thankful for our brethren who strive daily to live for thee, to rejoice in thee, to fight the fight of faith. We're thankful for their fellowship. And we pray for all of us that we'll draw near to thee, that we can draw near to one another. Help us to love the truth and to hate evil. Help us to love the souls, of men and women, boys and girls, and lead the gospel of Jesus Christ. May we truly realize how brief, how uncertain life the flesh is. But help us to know that in Christ, we have the expectation, the joy of eternal life before us. So help us to order our lives, to bring every thought and subjection to thy son. May that be our goal in life. Look down upon us with tender mercy, and may we have the same mercy toward others. We pray it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen.